Hello everyone, this is Mark Sabatella from Mastering MuseScore, and welcome to the MuseScore Cafe. This is my regular series. We talk about some aspect of making music using MuseScore, and uh, we normally have a theme that we talk about every week and kind of explore that theme. Sometimes there's some special uh, themes going on, Ask Me Anything sessions we do at the beginning of the month. This is going to be the last session for the year. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to take the next couple of weeks off for a Christmas holiday here. And so we're really going to just kind of explore today uh, some of the, uh, you know, what's been going on in the world of MuseScore over the last year and what we have to look forward to. We'll talk about both MuseScore, the program itself. We'll talk about the world of mastering MuseScore, right? My own personal little corner of the world where, you know, the courses and the community and so forth. And, and you know, take whatever questions you have, big picture questions, especially. I mean, if there's detail oriented, how do you do blah, blah, blah in MuseScore? We'll see if we can get to a couple things like that. But mostly, let's talk about the overall story of MuseScore here. And I'll give you a little background for people who are maybe new and don't know uh, much background. So MuseScore uh, is obviously free open source notation program. You all are familiar with what it is. And we're currently on MuseScore 4.1.1, right? That's the version here. MuseScore, 4, MuseScore 1 came out in 2011. And then uh, MuseScore 2 in 2015, 3 in, I believe it was 2018, and then MuseScore 4 in 2021. So it's been, you know, roughly every three years or so for a major version of the program. And it's really kind of advanced a lot during that time. MuseScore 1 had a ton of promise, and that's when I sort of jumped on board. Like a few weeks before the release of MuseScore 1, I sort of came on board, and I've been watching the progress ever since. And uh, it's really been kind of fun and exciting to watch. And this last year in particular has been probably one of the more eventful years, if we can include maybe last December. So we'll we'll talk about the year since this date last year. So obviously the big thing that happened was the release of MuseScore 4. And I know um, not everyone is using it. Some people are still using MuseScore 3 for whatever reason, but MuseScore 4 has been a huge advance in the quality of the engraving output, as well as what's possible from the playback, as well as some nice usability improvements and, and, and whatnot. And so I'm going to kind of highlight some of the things that have been new when 4.0 came out, when 4.1 came out, and now 4.2 is about to come out. And even though there's nothing I can like promise for sure about what's coming next, I can show you a little bit about how to keep tabs on this. And, uh, you know, I have some other information just from my own connections and my, you know, the fact that I do contribute to the software some. I, I haven't really done any programming uh, much uh, for the last couple of years, really. But I still am, uh, you know, tied into that. So um, definitely, if you've got, uh, you know, things that you're curious about, about direction, big picture kind of stuff, be, sh be but be feeling free to uh, ask me about that or talk about that in the chat and so forth. So um, if you haven't been following this, uh, the, the, the series of cafes and haven't really been following what's going on with, with MuseScore. This is MuseScore 4 that we're looking at, right? So you're probably mostly familiar with this, but let me just give you the quick overview, right? We have the side panel now with the palettes, instruments, and properties, toolbars at the top. There's things that are similar in the overall organization, but all these things look different than they did in MuseScore 3, right? That in itself, the complete redesign of the user interface was, um, it's something that it's impossible to sort of overstate maybe the significance of it because there's a ton of usability testing behind this, uh, you know, where people would like, you know, they would be sat, sat down in a room and say, here, try to complete the following task and given no documentation and try to figure things out. And then the things they couldn't figure out were identified as, well, these are the things we need to improve, right? And then you come up with a new design and give it to them and say, all right, now see if you can figure it out, et cetera. So, um, 
it's designed to make it much easier for people to figure out how to do things. But what it does mean is a lot of code has been rewritten in MuseScore 4 compared to previous versions. So for anyone who's a programmer or has any interest in this, one of the big things that changed is the way the user interface is written now uses a language, a system called QML. QML. And I don't know what it stands for. Yeah, I don't I, I don't know. Markup like Q, QT markup language, maybe. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but it's a system that's designed to be a lot more flexible, a lot more powerful than the system that was used to implement the old MuseScore user interface. But this is one reason why certain features from MuseScore 3 that were originally there uh, are not present in MuseScore 4 because basically everything had to be rewritten and anything that had a user interface to it that had, well, the, the, the underpinnings of the feature didn't have to be rewritten, but the user interface did. So, um, some things that I like, well, we're going to have to rewrite this interface, but it's not a commonly used tool. So we, we are going to put it off until later. Or in some cases, we don't like how it worked before. And uh, we're going to have to redesign it and we'll have to think about that. So let me show you right now one of the things that's coming in 4.2. 4.2 is going to release probably... Uh, at one point, I heard it could be this week. I don't know if that's still um, a possibility that it might be this week, but it will be very soon. So I'm going to go ahead and launch uh, the 4.2 beta here and just show uh, some stuff about it. Um, you know, we did a preview of that before, of course, but as it's getting closer to release, I want to build a, you know, some of the things that I want to show you um, kind of require us to take a look at this again. So um, what I want to show you here is the new instrument or, or sound selection dialog. So if you open the mixer, <clears throat> you'll see you know, the place where you select sounds. And this used to just have one big long list of every single sound, right? In MuseScore 3, that was just one big long list of every single sound that was available in the sound font. And that was sort of not ideal for a number of reasons. It was hard to find what you're looking for. And it also didn't work very well as far as like being able to select one, one sound font for one instrument, different sound font for another instrument. So they've known forever that they've wanted to redesign that, right? And they just, it just hadn't happened yet because it was sort of a big task to figure it out and they didn't want to do it wrong. And this is, kind of maybe an important thing to understand about the the direction things are going and the fact that there's an actual design team. MuseScore has never had designers before, right? We just had programmers and we implemented stuff how we thought it should work, but we never did user testing or anything like that. No one had a user interface design background. And now there are people with a very strong user interface design background. So um, anyhow, if you want to switch sounds, when you come to the sound font list, you'll see now you can select uh, the specific sound font you want here. And if it's a general MIDI sound font, you pick the choose automatically option and it will just pick that sound. Um, but if you want to look at the contents of this to see all of the sounds that are within it, then you can see these and they're at least organized into different banks because a lot of these sound fonts have different sounds in different banks. And if you know, if you're familiar with how that sound font is organized, then you'll know what these banks are about. I don't know what this, I don't know how this sound font is organized. That doesn't really help me. But within the actual uh, um, MS Basic, the default MuseScore sound font, it's organized that much better where the instrument sounds are organized into instrument families. So, and these these names of these families come from general MIDI, um, but it's designed to, to, to suggest the score ordering, right? Flutes go at the top of an orchestral score. So all the flute type instruments 
or sounds are listed first, and then all of the reed instruments, and then all of the brass instruments, and then all of the voice sounds, and then all the piano sounds, and then the organ sounds, the guitar sounds, and so forth. So it's much easier now to select the individual sound that you want. And this is a really simple thing conceptually. You say, oh yeah, it's just a couple of lists and you, you organize it this way, but it takes a lot of thought into how you're going to do this, how you're gonna organize this to make this possible, to make this the improvement that it is. And that's why sometimes these things take a while because it's like you don't want to put something that's kind of uh, half-assed out there and um, and have it, not be very good and then have documentation written around it and then have to change it and so forth right so <clears throat> anyhow the it, it, things are moving very quickly and yet very deliberately i think that is maybe uh, an important thing that i can talk about so um when we talk about uh so that's something that's coming like very soon this this again is 4.2 that we're looking at and this is like the current nightly build, but I think we're just days away from the actual release. Um, so let's talk about what is actually, you know, what's been new in MuseScore. For, in MuseScore. Uh, obviously, the Muse sounds is the big thing. Like when I play this score here, you're going to hear an English horn. Um, so, uh, Graham, I'm going to come back to that in a second. Right, this is the piece that I showed in my piano fifths demo so that's you know that is the english horn sound in muse sounds which is you know uh indicative of the sorts of things that caused muse score 4 to be such a big deal when it came out that's probably the most realistic sound of an English horn and piano of any notation software, right? So the question about voice sounds. So the thing is the voice sounds were hugely, right? Muse sounds, voice sounds are hugely improved, um, but only the choir sounds, right? So Muse sounds is hugely improved over any sound font, but um, I'll have to crank up the volume because they're quiet. But uh, let's listen to this with the Muse Sounds Choir. Right, and that's still kind of too quiet. I would have to turn down the piano more to uh, really have that feel like it balances well. But uh, in any case, that choir sound compared to uh, the old sound font version of, uh, what am I looking for, Voices, Choir Oz. And let's turn these down now, because these are gonna be loud. This is very synthesized sounding, right? It's just very synthesized sounding. So, and that's true of almost every sound font. Almost every sound font is just very synthesized when you listen to the voice sound. So Muse Sounds is is a huge, huge, huge improvement. However, there have not been improvements to it since 4.0 came out, right? So when 4.0 came out, it came with Muse Sounds, which has these amazing choir sounds, but they haven't changed since then. There's been improvements to some of the other sounds, meanwhile, um, but... Uh, uh, the choir sounds are still quiet, and I'm not sure why they chose to do that and why that's not been changed, but in any case, that is the case that the choir sounds are still quiet. Um, and there's still no solo voice sounds. I would assume those would come someday. Someday, I would expect those. But let me show you something that just, just this, just last night dropped. Was it this? No, it was this morning this dropped. Um, so a couple weeks ago, or was it even just last week? I, I uh, played you the demo of the Muse Sounds guitars. They are now 
here in if you're using the beta version of the Muse Hub. So if you've in if you have the beta version of Muse Hub going on or on Linux, it's called Muse Sounds Manager now instead of Muse Hub because they realize well it doesn't do everything that the that the Windows it doesn't it doesn't handle installation of the program. Uh, it just does Muse Sounds, and so they've decided to give it its own name, Muse Sounds Manager. Anyhow, uh, if you're using the beta version of Muse Hub or the beta version of Muse Sounds Manager, you will now see Guitars Volume 1. So I can't really show this thing off yet because I, uh, I downloaded it onto one of my systems, uh, but, on, but then immediately uh, the server got jammed and now I try to download it and it's just kind of uh, locked up but just so you you know see what this thing is about it's going to have these sounds in it it's going to have uh, um, nylon and steel string acoustic guitars going to have a, a LP guitar which I assume is Les Paul an SC guitar which I assume is a Stratocaster as well as electric bass and Graham no the uh, vocal sounds just have the choir Oz right now for Muse sounds I mean the, the old sound fonts are still there you can still install new sound fonts but um, so far there are just choir sounds choir Oz sounds so anyhow this is what is uh, coming so the Les Paul sounds has uh, assuming that's what LP is clean lead and heavy sounds and the SC or hope I think that means Stratocaster also has uh, clean heavy and lead sounds so um, this is coming with 4.2 when it releases so again if you have the beta channel the beta version of Muse Hub or Muse Sounds uh, you can try to download it right now, but you can see right now it's telling me it's going to take a day to download this thing. So I'm just going to not bother trying. I'm going to wait until the server decides to fix itself. So, um, yeah, so there's things that have come with uh, MuseScore 4 that are, you know, big deals. And the biggest big deal was really the user interface redesign, which, you know, for people who are longtime users, that's sort of like, I don't care about a new user interface. I, I was used to the old one. But the idea is to make it much easier for new users and testing and comments and so forth are definitely bearing that out. Uh, new users are definitely finding it to be a much easier user interface. For the rest of us, it just means something to get used to and some features that had to wait to come back, like that sound selection that I just showed you. Some of the things that have come along better for the ride are things like accessibility, which was sort of hacked into MuseScore 3 and MuseScore 2 before it, um, whereas it's kind of built into MuseScore 4. And it's built in in a way that um, uh, actually, if I come here to edit preferences, one of the things you're going to see uh, that I've showed before is the Braille panel. And so the Braille panel will show you Braille for any uh, measure that you select. And as of 4.2, it will be possible to actually enter Braille as well. Unfortunately, I still don't understand how that works uh, very well. And it seems to only be supported. Per well, it's not supported on my Linux system. That's all I can tell you. So I, I can use it on my Windows system, but I haven't figured out if there's something I have to do to my keyboard to enable multi-key input. But Braille input will now be a thing. And also one of the big things for MuseScore 4 has been uh, Braille export, as well as support for screen readers on Mac OS, which never, you know, voiceover basically, which was never supported before and now it is. So, so MuseScore 4 has opened up a lot of worlds as far as uh, accessibility for music. And another thing that, uh, that goes with it is they really worked on the music XML import and export to make trans uh to make translation tools if you want to translate from a uh, muse score to a uh, braille using an external tool use, using music xml and then convert from music xml to braille we've done a lot of work i say we i didn't do any of it um 
but the MuseCore team did a lot of work improving the music XML export in ways that Braille converters find more useful. So it's, it is definitely becoming more and more possible to get good Braille output from MuseScore and things like the Braille input feature that's new with 4.2. <clears throat> and when I show you some of the stuff that's on the roadmap for next year, you'll see that accessibility related things are, are kind of big. It's just a continual process of improvement. So um, one of the other things that I want to just show you as just a little, uh, let me think about where this thing even is. I have a, a test score I created. Um, and to be honest, I'm not sure where it is right now because I was rearranging all my scores recently because I got tired of everything being kind of uh, um, floating around everywhere. So I, grazing, is it in there? No. Um, uh, but in any case, the uh, the engraving improvements in MuseScore 4 is one of the other huge improvements that has been... Uh, being worked on that uh, is continuing to be a thing. There's a full-time person uh, now, a guy, named, a guy named Simon, who is responsible for looking at every detail of the engraving. And when we talk about engraving in music, we mean details of how the thing, all the details, the spacing between the notes, how far the accidental is from the note, how long the stems are, how things align between staves, all these details are what we call engraving, the actual appearance of your score. And it's been a constant uh, series of improvements that have been made, uh, really starting with MuseScore 2, which made some significant engraving improvements, and then MuseScore 3 made some more significant engraving improvements, but MuseScore 4 has really uh, upped the ante um, hugely. And so I've probably showed a version of this uh, score before, but I'm going to show it to you again uh, now so that you can really see what I mean when I talk about engraving improvements. And this is ongoing work. This is not like um, uh, something that like, okay, we improved it for MuseScore 4 and now we're done. That's not the case at all. The uh, improvements that I'm talking about are ongoing improvements. So let's, let's uh, just give me a moment. So here is MuseScore 3 looking at a particular score. Let me close the inspector here. And let's talk about, oh, it looks like I edited this thing to add some text to it. Let me get rid of that text. All right. So looks like I made a bunch of changes in here. That's not intentional. This note should have been down an octave. All right. Um, if we look at the MuseScore 3 version there's of this score, there's all sorts of things that we can like complain about. And like some of them have to do with like, look at how much extra space is in here when we have these triplets against these sixteenths or these eighth notes against those triplets. Look how uneven those sixteenths are, how uneven those triplets are. Look at things like the... Uh, the height of the stems on these 2Ds compared to the height of the stems on those 4Ds. This is all not good stuff. Look at things like how much space is between these eighth notes compared to these eighth notes compared to these eighth notes compared to those eighth notes. Yes, there's accidentals here, but they shouldn't have needed so much extra space, but they did. So this is the sort of thing that MuseScore 3, you know, it, it, it made it readable. Yes, you can read this, but it's not good. And so a big part of what has been going on uh, in MuseScore 4, and every single release has further improvements, is all those details. Like, remember how awful the spacing was with those triplets against the 16ths and the triplets against the 8ths, right? Look how bad it was in MuseScore 3 and how nice it is in MuseScore 4. Remember how 
uneven these stem lengths were, even though these are all the same note, just because it was beamed in twos versus beamed in fours. MuseScore 4 no longer makes that mistake. Look at the spacing of the eighth notes in MuseScore 3. Close together in, in that pickup measure, close together in this measure, but really, really wide in this measure with the accidentals for not really any good reason. These accidentals here are adding all that extra space for not really any good reason. If you look at it now in MuseScore 4, those that spacing is like perfect. The spacing is, is you know, there's no additional space that's not needed for whatever reason. I mean, if I make this B here a double flat, you'll see it adds enough space for that note, but it doesn't mess up the spacing in the rest of the measure. Or if you look at look at this note here and that accidental, this accidental is actually tucking underneath that note, right? These are all the sorts of details that professional engravers, you know, pride themselves on getting right. And Simon looked at MuseScore and said, no, no, this stuff is all wrong. You know, there were some things that we were doing well. Um, but in MuseScore 3, there were some things we were doing well, but there was a lot that wasn't really right. And he's sort of like just gone through and said, you know, here's some things that we need to improve. And it's got a, a team of programmers working, reporting directly to him, making these improvements. And every release improves them further. And so uh, MuseScore 4, one of the things I think I showed you, but I'll show again because heck, why not, is these ties right here. I can set like this tie here because it's a chord. Um, it defaults to being inside the note heads, which is the norm uh, for that. But if you want, you can just click this button and now get that tie to be outside the note heads, right? Inside, outside, etc. So that's um, you know, one of the kinds of uh, things that's new in MuseScore four point two. So this is going to continue to be a big push going forward, um, uh, is continuing to tweak those engraving improvements. And then also when I talked about view sounds, yes, uh, the, the vocal, the choir sounds haven't been improved yet, but I'm imagining they are on the list for improvement. I don't know a particular schedule or anything like that, but I can tell you that, well, they've added the guitars, obviously, that's but that was a huge thing that just happened today and it will hit hit the streets for real probably you know sometime in the next few days but um there was also like when MuseScore, score when mu sounds first came out you know complaints that the ranges of instruments some instruments didn't go high enough or low, low enough and they've been gradually improving that i know that the pace of that improvement has not been as fast as many would like um and i think it's because they really decided to focus on guitars and now hopefully they'll come back and continue to work on further improvements to the sounds, um, to, to the other sounds. Um, so uh, sounds are continuing to be a focus. User interface in general continues to be a focus and engraving continues to be a focus. So let me talk a little bit about some of the things that have happened within the MuseScore, the, the Mastery MuseScore community. So um, because this is stuff that's gonna directly impact you know, pretty much anyone watching here. Um, so obviously the, the MuseScore Cafe, we've been doing uh, years now, right? We've several years of MuseScore Cafe, been really enjoying doing this. I'm going to be continuing to do it, not really expecting any changes there or anything. But some of the things that are new here is like this search box at the top of the, uh, um, the the search box at the top of the window here um you know i don't know if you've realized how powerful this is and so it's become more powerful in the last few months and is going to continue to get more powerful going forward if i put in a search term for say dynamics since that's uh, something that people are talking about right now in the chat if i type dynamics into here you will see uh first of all you know all the posts where people have asked about um, questions about dynamics, but you'll also see 
uh, the lessons that talk about dynamics within the course. So Master and Muse Core 4, here's the lesson on dynamics. And uh, there's additional dynamic features. And oh, in the basic music theory course, there's dynamics, right? Oh, and um, uh, accessibility also. So this is a cool thing. This I have a lesson on accessibility for adding markings. And you can see the word dynamic shows up in the text of that lesson. In other words, one of the things that's happening now is the videos, all the videos, including these cafes, have automatically generated transcripts. And this search facility will actually find things uh, in those videos. Uh, so, you know, you think about like something, whatever I talked about last week uh, in the MuseCore Cafe. What, is, what did I do? Last week was... was um, Last week was the Ask Me Anything session. Does anyone remember a specific question that got asked? If I, you know, if I may, if I search for, you know, something that appeared in last week's video, it would show up here. And so, and this facility is going to be improved in the coming year to make it more, um, like not just keyword based. Like right now, it's really just about keywords. You can't type a whole sentence. I mean, you can type a sentence, but it's not going to it's not going to understand the sentence. It's just going to look for those words. But coming in the next year is going to be an actual uh, like a chat bot kind of a thing where you can type a question and it will come up with an answer for you. I don't know when that's going to happen. Uh, the Circle has been working on it. I've seen their demos on their site. It works great. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, not sure what's holding it up from be, uh, allowing the rest of us to use it, but they assure us it's coming next year. So I mentioned the basic music theory course and that when I type dynamics, a lesson came up in there, but that's one of the new things also that's happened in our community, right? Is now there are courses directly here in the community. Uh, there is the basic theory course and now the harmony and chord progressions course, which we are just wrapping up now. And the courses used to be on a separate site called Teachable. This site isn't going away. The, the Teachable site isn't going away, but I am transitioning the older courses to the Circle site because functionality-wise, it, it you know it's the courses were mostly just videos with handouts, and I can do that on either site, but. The, the fact that now we have this whole community and the ability to be asking questions and discussing things and, and have everything kind of all together in one place is, to me, a very powerful thing that makes these courses uh, just so much uh, more engaging than they ever were. I mean, when I first launched the Harmony and Chord Progressions course, uh, let me just view the course here. When I launched the Harmony and Chord Progressions course, uh, like uh, three years ago, I want to say, um, people liked it. I mean, people definitely liked it. And I know a handful of you here had taken it back then. I'm not sure. Graham, were you one of them? I can't remember. But I know several, uh, quite a few people took the Harmony course when I first did it. And I had some exercises to do and I would try to give feedback and all, but it wasn't anything like what we're doing now where um, uh, everyone is able to basically work on the course together and we discuss things and, you know, it's the way it's all tied together. Uh, and again, having the AI search facility so that I can just type, like I'm thinking like, where did I hear that thing about um, uh, French augmented sixth chords? Um, you know, uh, I can't remember what it was. Oh, look, here's a post about it. And if I go to lessons, you know, here's the project, here's other lessons, etc. cetera, right? So, um, the, the ability to have all this stuff tied together has been huge. And so I want to talk about what's going to come next year as far as this goes. The Counterpoint course is the is the next big course, well, really the only big course that is currently on the Teachable site that I want to move over. So I'm going to tell you right now what my kind of thinking is about this. I shared this during office hours yesterday, but um, uh, I, I want... I want to do to the counterpoint course the same thing we just did for the harmony course. So we'll have it where the lessons come out every week or two. You work on those lessons. We have a project, some assignments, whatever. I give feedback. We discuss it during music master class th that same week and so forth. So I'm planning on doing that with the counterpoint course. Now, 
the thing with the uh, counterpoint course is it in some ways it's a bigger course than the harmony course i mean it's i don't know if it literally is bigger in terms of the number of lessons or the lengths of the videos but in terms of its scope in terms of how much it takes to to really get inside all the concepts it's a course that we're going to want to go through more slowly it's going to take time to go through so i'm probably planning on breaking it up and spreading the material out more um so that's as a heads up i'll probably have a basic harmony no not basic harmony basic counterpoint i, I, don't, I won't call it that but um that has the main concepts that everyone needs to know and then break off a separate little chunk of the course just to discuss uh say renaissance motets or just to discuss baroque fugues perhaps canons also i don't know i haven't decided exactly how this is going to work but we're going to do a in-depth look at counterpoint next year and spread it out and i want to spread it out in part because i don't want people to worry about getting behind because as joanne's saying it's it's really easy to get behind in a course if new lessons are coming at you every week and new stuff to work on if we have opportunities where there's like a breather you work on counterpoint for a couple months and say all right i'm i want to like not have to think about counterpoint for a while while i get on with my life we're going to have little breaks built into it in which we can work on other things and so i want to continue to do things those of you who have been following uh what i do for a while you remember i've done like little mini units on uh barbershop i did one on beatles uh songs and and all sorts of ear training all sorts of specific topics that we've investigated not as part of a formal course but as a thing that i was calling the musicianship skills workshop well that's going to continue to be a thing and perhaps a, a bigger thing uh going forward next year um we'll find uh <clears throat> topics that people are interested in one of the new features by the way in um uh in the community here is if i create a post I don't know if you all can do it. You'll have to tell me this. Um, if I go ahead and create a post, you'll see that I now have the ability to add a poll and have questions and options. I, it might only be for admin people, but y'all can try this and let me know if you're all if you're all allowed to create polls or not. I haven't tried it. This feature just released a few days ago in Circle, but I'm going to create a poll and get your feedback on some of the things that I'm talking about here um, as far as how I'm planning on organizing things with the courses and whatnot. Okay, so I want to flip back. Oh, by the way, Merry Christmas. It is Christmas time, right? And I have my uh, Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Try to have it set up behind me, but you can't see it there really. Um, but in any case, um, there you go. Um, uh, so let me let me flip back to showing you some MuseScore stuff here, uh, so you can get an idea of things that are uh, coming up. So the first thing I want to show you is this page here. This is on GitHub, and let me get back to where this is. Uh, There we go. So, um, ooh, Robin's picture. Nice. Nice. Um, uh, the release notes is um, the place where you can find out what's new in every version of MuseScore. You know, they use this uh, gets updated. So that you can see there's the beta releases of MuseScore 4.2. There's a beta 2. Supposedly there was a beta 3, but I don't see it listed here. Um, I don't know if they're actually doing the beta 3 um, or not, or if they're just calling it that, but it's really the nightly builds. To be honest, I'm not really sure how that's working. Um, but this is where you can see uh, like when MuseScore 4.1 came out, here's all the new features it had, right? The new reverb unit. Uh, that's another new thing about the playback. That's a huge improvement over MuseScore 3 is the ability to have independent reverb for every instrument in your score. Um, 
the the live braille where that displays the braille uh which you saw me um you know you you got to see in uh right down here that's the live braille it's showing what's in the and if you change notation here the braille updates also um so this is where you'll see what's in each release, but this is a good view of the past, right? You can find out everything that was new in every release. So that's a good page to know about here. Um, the other, though, really good page to know about if you're curious about the future is, let me actually get rid of that. Let me just click where it says projects here and make sure that's the right link. Okay, here we go. This is what's called the projects page, and this is where you can kind of track what's coming. Now, it's not, uh, how would I put it? Well, let's look at the 4.2 thing first. You, you can see what we're looking at. It's a way that the development team tracks what uh, is going to be in each release. And so you'll see that for MuseScore, whoops, MuseScore 4.2 here, uh, there's a list of what's to triage, meaning maybe a bug that someone submitted, but they haven't looked at it yet. They haven't figured out if it's if it's a bug that needs fixing for 4.2 or not. And then you see ready for development, meaning uh, these are ones that they've looked at. They've decided, yes, this is going to be something to be fixed. And then there's in progress. These are things that um, uh, someone is currently working on uh, fixing. These ones that say it needs porting, these mean someone has done the work, uh, but um, someone has done the work, but they haven't specifically copied it into the 4.2 release. So the way MuseScore works is even though 4.2 is coming, there's also work being done on for 4.3 right now. There's some work being done for 4.3 now. So some work that's done, it needs to be both for 4.3 and for 4.2. And so usually they'll do it for 4.3 first and then port it to MuseScore 4.2. So these are the things that still need, that have already been done, but uh, need to be ported to, and, and it's just, a question of pushing some buttons and actually uh i i know like an hour ago they just pushed something that fixed a bunch of these so i i think this list is already a little out of date and then these are all the things that are already done these are the things that they said we're going we want to fix these bugs or implement these features or make this improvement uh and these are the ones that are already done. And you can see there's a ton of things already done for MuseScore 4.2. So this is how you can keep track of that kind of stuff. So that's what's coming like next week or this week, uh, you know, in the next few days sometime, maybe the next week or two. Um, let's take a look at the 4.3 one. So 4.3, you'll see these are issues that have been triaged, issues to fix, and are ready for someone to start trying to fix. And there's a long list of issues to fix. Uh, some, uh, you know, some of them are just bugs. Uh, some of them are just little tweaks to the user interface, the amount of space on either side of the scroll bar or whatever. So, uh, but, you know, there's so there's various different things. Here's an accessibility issue that if you've got a Braille display plugged in, uh, that Braille panel I showed you on screen, that's obviously not very useful if you're blind, but the point is that that's supposed to also go to a Braille display, which is a device you plug into your computer and it has actual raised pins so that you can read the Braille with your fingertips like Braille is normally read. Um, that works great on Windows, but doesn't work on Mac OS. So that's one of the things that there is on the list of uh, things to fix for 4.3. But you can also see priorities. There's P1, P2, and P3. Pretty much everything you see, P1 means this is almost certainly going to get fixed. P2 means we want to get to this for sure if there's time. P3 means, yeah, if someone comes along and volunteers to do this, we will not say no. The help wanted tag basically means um, you know, this is one I haven't seen before, but this means, I, I believe, uh, that no one on the development team has access to a Braille output device on Mac. 
So no one on the development team is capable of testing to see if it works and to analyze why it's not working and to try to fix it. So we need a developer, someone with development experience who has a Braille output device and a Mac OS system who can actually help work on that feature or bu you know, fi bug fix basically. So by looking at the MuseScore 4.3 release and seeing what's been re what's been marked P2 versus uh, P1 versus uh, P3, you'll get a sense of what they're planning on doing for, uh, I'm just making sure that I'm still alive here. I got to do that every once in a while. Um, you'll get a sense of what they're planning on trying to do. This isn't an absolute commitment like this thing will totally happen. Some of the things on this list were originally going to happen for MuseScore 4.2 and then got put off. Here's one of them. Uh, the, there, you see that there's a, 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 a thing that says add preference for muting instruments when hidden. You, one of the things you may be aware of right now in MuseScore uh, 4 if I take an instrument, like say that English horn right here, and I come over to the instruments panel and I mute that in, or hide that instrument, when I play the score now, it doesn't play. Hiding the instrument also mutes it. And that was by design because it's how parts are designed to work. You can hide and show instruments within parts and uh, then you would want them muted. But for the score, you probably don't want it that way. So they're planning on implementing a setting that controls how that works. If you haven't seen this, by the way, in MuseScore uh, 4 currently, the way you would hide an instrument but not mute it is don't hide the instrument, the main listing, hide its staff. And now when you play it, it uh, does what we expect or you know, at least what I might have expected, hides the instrument but doesn't mute it. So that capability is already there, but it just requires that extra step of opening up the uh, um, instrument listing there to, to see the staff and then mute the staff. And so it's a little hard to figure out and it's an extra step. So this was something that they knew when they released 4.0, this isn't how we want it to be, but the, and I, I pushed hard to say, let's see if we can come up with a better solution. And people were like, yes, there needs to be a better solution, but no one could agree on what the better solution should be. And as a result, they said, you know what? We're not gonna put out one of these half-assed things that no one can agree is really the way to do it. Let's just leave it as is right now and wait until we're sure we know how we wanna do it. So that's still in progress. So for 4.2, it was going to happen, a work was done on it, but if I click on this one right now, we'll see, um, you know, there's, uh, uh, this is a mock-up of what the dialog box should look like that lets you control how, um, how muting works, and then there's discussion about uh, that design and work done to implement it, but realistically, they got partway through it, and then uh, a month or so ago, they got to a point of saying, "You know what? We're there's still we're still not sure about some things. There's still some stuff that's going to need to happen before we're ready to really do this work." So they took it off of the 4.2 project and moved it to the 4.3 project. So this is stuff you can see by looking at that, that issue. I clicked on that issue to open it up and you'll see where it's where the, the new feature is described or the bug is described. And then you'll see all these status messages here. They moved it to in progress on October 4th for MuseScore 4.2. They were working on it, but after a month of working on it, they got to a point of saying, you know what, this is this isn't something that we want to commit to for 4.2, we're going to put it off. So this kind of tracking is something that you all can do. Anyone who's curious about the future of MuseScore can be doing these things here, right? So um, if you look through, so these are the things that are like listed as, yeah, we kind of want to get to these things. These are some that are the design is done and we're absolutely positive that they are going to get worked on. Um, and so these are ones that, yeah, we, we, we're pretty sure we want to do. These are kind of the we're absolutely going to do. These 
are ones that are actively being worked on, right? And these are ones that are actually done. So some of these things that are done are going to also make it into 4.2. Remember that porting section. Some of the things that were done for 4.3, they'll say, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and put this into 4.2 also. One of them, by the way, I don't know, Dean, if you are watching, but um, there's a bug uh, that you can encounter sometimes in uh, MuseScore 4, where if you have tempo changes while a note is sustaining, uh, if you have tempo changes while a note is sustaining, it will um, do weird things like the, the length of the note doesn't get calculated correctly. It, it, uh, it doesn't account for the tempo change properly, and the note either will sustain too long or not long enough. Same can happen with fermatas. If you've got fermatas in different places on different staves, because like one of them, the fermata is on beat one, and on another staff, it's on beat three. There's all sorts of little glitches that can happen there. And... Dean had asked about that during uh, maybe last week's Ask Me Anything session. I'm not sure. And I said, you know, it's funny. Uh, I, I don't know if that's being worked on, but I know it's a problem. And it turned out that day someone uh, worked, put in a fix for it. And uh, but at the time it was going to be just for 4.3. It wasn't clear if that fix was going to make it to 4.2. But if we look at the 4.2 list right now, you'll see under needs porting, uh, it's this guy right here. So this one has been identified as making it into 4.2. And I saw just an hour ago, someone actually did that. They haven't merged the change yet, but this is, so this is going to happen for 4.2. So a bunch of little glitches that have to do with that sort of thing are going to be uh, fixed for 4.2, which is great. And this is all stuff because MuseScore is open source, we can see all of this, right? We can track all of this. So I'm kind of showing you a tour of how to get a sense of where things are in, uh, in, in um, uh, the development process, because, you know, I know a lot of people are curious about these things, but also be aware that if you submit um, bugs, you know, that this is kind of what happens. So let me go get back to the main MuseScore page. Uh, the main MuseScore page on GitHub, let me just post this here. Main GitHub page for MuseScore is this. And this is where, when you have bug reports, they are going to go here to where it says issues. And you see all these different uh, bugs. Some of these are bugs. Some of them are feature requests. Some of them are just misunderstandings. And I can't emphasize this enough. The MuseScore team, the core programmers, do not want people using this issue uh, tracker here on GitHub just to ask questions or to say, hey, I think something's wrong. Can someone look at it? This is supposed to be things that are absolutely confirmed to be real bugs. So definitely use the discussion and support space within my course first, you know, to make sure something's a real bug. And when then we can check to see if it's been reported, right? So if we're looking for bugs having to do with fermatas, uh, we can type the word fermata here. And, um, and uh, Jana, I think this is your bug right here. I think that you're going to find that this bug is now fixed. I guess we'll find out. Sh we'll find out shortly, but I believe you're going to find out that that bug is now fixed. So um, this is where when you submit a bug, you'll hit the new issue button here and then say, get started on a bug report, etc. So if you found a bug and you're absolutely positive it's reproducible and you've got a, a score that you can attach, you'll have to zip it before you can attach it. But you know you, you want to make sure that it's 100% reproducible. The developer can read your bug report, download the score you attached, reproduce the problem, and then start investigating it. GitHub is where you do it. What I'm going to say also, there is a discussions tab. So if we look across the top, you'll see the issues tab here. The code tab is where the actual code is. For, so for those of you who are programmers, if I go under source uh, and then common sense, oh, common scene. <laughs> um, scene is sort of a internal term that's used for things having to do with the user interface. Um, but uh, this is the actual source code for MuseScore here. So when you hear, you know, if, if, 
that it's open source, well, this is what it means to be open. It means this is the source to MuseScore. If you know C++, you can read this code, understand how things work. And then if you're a programmer, you can go ahead and say, hey, the, I, I recognize there's a bug here. This shouldn't say blah, 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 blah. It should say blah, blah, blah. And then you go ahead and you make that change and you submit what's called a pull request. And uh, there's a whole process for that and so forth. So on that main tab there, you saw the code is where the code is. Issues is where uh, you report bugs. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. Pull requests. This is when someone has um, actually uh, submitted a fix. And uh, You'll see that these are all fixes here that people have submitted over the last few days for various issues. Some of these are going to make it into 4.2. Some of them will probably be for 4.3. Some of them are to fix issues that aren't even present in 4.2, but they're things that got broken during the 4.3 development. So, um, so that's what the pull requests are. So, Robin, you're talking about the discussions tab. So, this discussions tab exists. I will say. It is almost completely, uh, it's a ghost town. It exists, I mean, take a look at the discussions here. This one was started March 19th. This one was started yesterday. This one four days ago. This one February. This one August of last year. This one asked three weeks ago unanswered. Yeah, this is, it exists, but don't think of this as your go-to place to ask stuff about MuseScore. The place for that is MuseScore.org or my course. So I want to kind of conclude this session a little bit by talking a little bit more about my course. All right. So first of all, those of you who are in the course, great, you're in the course. Those of you who are not in the course yet, you want to think about it. And I'm going to introduce some new options for the course, a way to sign up for it on uh, where you don't have to like just enroll all at once, but you can just say, well, I just want to be in it for a few months so I can learn some things and then leave uh, ways of doing that. But also I want to make it more service oriented. So things like that search feature that I showed you, it's great that you can search the lessons as they are now, but when that AI search chatbot things comes up, imagine how powerful it will be to be able to say, you know, how do I enter a triplet? And then it just gives you an answer, right? I mean, that's the kind of stuff that's going to be coming to the course. And then, of course, there's also the support area within the course where if you don't get an answer from the AI chatbot or its answer isn't very good, ask and I'll answer or some other user who knows about such things can answer. I also want to simplify that bug reporting process for people. And I will make that commitment that if you're in the course and uh, you have a bug and you are able to show me how to reproduce the thing, I can take care of submitting it to GitHub for you. Because, yeah, this is all techie stuff that not everyone is going to necessarily need to uh, um want to have to deal with. You have to create an account on GitHub to be able to um, do this and so forth. So um, anyhow, there's going to be changes and new stuff coming to the course. Uh, so you're going to be hearing about this in the coming weeks. That's, um, I guess, all I can say about that. I don't I don't have the answers now. I, I know the kinds of things I'm thinking. So I know this session has been kind of all over the place. I'm just showing you a bunch of different things, but uh, no single topic was worth an entire cafe episode. It felt like a good place to, um, uh, I don't know, just sort of catch up on just the world of MuseScore and where things are and where things are going. I really wish, I'm going to try one more time to uh, see if I can get that uh, um, guitar thing downloaded. Because it's, uh, I know from my other system when it downloaded, it downloaded in, you know, less than a minute before the server jammed up. But um, in any case, I'm hoping to have that guitars uh, working by tomorrow. So that tomorrow in um, Music Masterclass, if anyone has their score for the project, I'll talk about that in a second, um, that wants guitar, I'll be able to... Uh, I'll be able to play it using Muse Guitar, and we'll get to see what that sounds like. So 
Let's talk a little bit just about the rest of the year. As I mentioned, this is the last cafe session for this year. We'll resume in January. Tomorrow will be the last music masterclass session for the year, and it's going to be basically a performance. So it's going to be everyone who's been in the Harmony course and has submitted a final project. I'm going to play the music, and we're just going to enjoy the music, right? Um, I'm going to not give a whole lot of, you know, blah, blah, blah about it. We're just going to enjoy the music and talk about what's, you know, what's interesting about the each piece and move on so that we can really just hear all the different things that people have been doing with what they've learned in the Harmony course. You've all done a fantastic job. I'm really looking forward to presenting your music. So, um, thanks so much, uh, for the comments, Robin, uh, uh, do I have a short opinion on using MuseScore on tablet? Uh, so, Robin, I, I will say I've never used a Mac, I mean, other than to, like, help someone with something briefly. But I will say uh, I prefer the Linux experience over the Muse, over the uh, Windows experience in general. But I'm not, like, a Linux diehard or anything. And this is actually a Chromebook that we're looking at. So we're looking at MuseScore running, you know, container with a Linux container, it's called within the Chrome Chrome OS system, which is all supported. It doesn't require any special hacking. It's just an option in in on my Chromebook to make it happen. But I will say that is the best option to getting MuseScore on a tablet. One of the new things with 4.2 is there's an ARM build, which is what most tablets run. So there's now going to be a Linux ARM build of MuseScore 4.2. So the Linux tablets like the Lenovo Duet is going to support MuseScore kind of out of the box now. For Windows, the uh, Microsoft Surface is the tablet that uh, that I use. But I, I don't recommend you trying to use it in tablet form because MuseScore is too keyboard oriented. You'll discover too many things, even if you're not a big keyboard shortcut person, you'll discover too many things that just require the keyboard to do, like shift clicking things and so forth, right? That Stuff like that. So in any case, I, I think... Uh, that if you're thinking about tablets specifically, think about ones with keyboards is, is my recommendation. And we can talk more about that online. Um, uh, so Kevin, a good question about the, or a good point about playback volume. So we'll definitely try to make sure we get that happening. Uh, and I'll try to do a test run beforehand. So all of that said, let's, uh, let's play out some music. Hopefully this music, so this music is loud, right? You can barely hear me talking because the music is so loud. So when all is set up properly, um, music should be plenty loud. But uh, I know like if you've written quiet dynamics in your piece, your piece will be quiet. And I remember there being some issue uh, last week with some pieces just coming out really quiet for no obvious reason. So I'll be looking into that. So. If you're able to make it tomorrow for the Music Masterclass, definitely come check out all the beautiful work that people have been creating. If you're not able to come, great. Uh, you know, I'll catch you next year. I want to thank everyone for everything. I mean, basically what I do right now, uh, what I do for a living is this, right? This is talking to you, teaching you about MuseCore, teaching you about music, engaging with people. This is my life and I love it. I mean, this is the sort of thing that, you know, if you had asked me when I was 20 years old, what do I wish that I could just do all day long if I was rich? It would be this. And <laughs> I'm not rich, but I'm, you know, I'm able to do this and have this be my life now. And I'm so thankful for everyone for making this all possible. And I'm just looking forward to more more and more going forward into 2024. So thanks everyone for a great year and I will see you next time.